Third, 2022 Zoning Board of Appeals meeting. I'm Candace Breyer, chairperson of the Zoning Board of Appeals. The Zoning Board of Appeals is a nine-person volunteer board nominated by the mayor and approved by city council. First, we will hear from planning services represented tonight by John Barrett. Then the applicant or their representative will make their presentation. Applicants will have five minutes in which to make their presentation. Staff will keep time and announce when 30 seconds are remaining. Public comment is available in person or remotely. We will first call on individuals present to address the board, then remote participants. To speak during a public hearing or during public comment remotely, press star nine if listening by phone or use the raise hand feature if viewing through the web link. For phone access, call 877-853-5247 and enter meeting ID 938-1648 one zero zero seven city staff will select callers that have raised their hand using the last three digits of your phone number or by name if available for those accessing through the web link you will hear an automated announcement that the host is allowing you to speak when speaking please move to a quiet area and mute any television or background sounds we may ask questions of either the city or the applicant we will acknowledge any written comments received by the board we will allow an appearing party to express their support or objections. The board will then discuss the appeal and formulate a motion to approve the appeal. Five affirmative votes of the board will be required for an appeal to be granted. Finally, any qualified party who is aggrieved by a decision of the board can appeal that decision to the Washtenaw County Circuit Court on a timely basis. Uh, quickly, before we have our roll call, I would like to welcome Chris Madigan, our newest ZBA member. Welcome, Chris. Um, all right, time for roll call. I am here. Mike Daniel. Here. Dave Devardi. Devardi here. Chris Madigan. Here. Julia Good. Chris Fraley. Here. Todd Grant. Here. Elizabeth Nelson. Here. We have a quorum. Moving on to approval of the agenda, are there any questions or comments regarding the agenda? If not, do I have a motion to approve the agenda? Motion from Mike. Support? Support. Support from Chris. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Moving on to approval of the minutes. We have minutes from the February 23rd, 2022 meeting. Are there any questions, comments, corrections to those minutes? If not, do I have a motion to approve the minutes? Motion from Chris, support from Mike. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right, moving on to our first public hearing this evening, petition ZBA 22-006-1200 Prospect Street. John? I'm John Barrett, zoning coordinator for the city of Ann Arbor. The first petition this evening is ZBA 22-006. The address is 1200 Prospect Street. Chris Vessels, representing the property owner, is requesting permission from section 5.32.2, alteration to a non-conforming structure to create habitable space in the basement and construct a second story to the existing non-conforming duplex. The existing duplex units both contain two bedrooms and a bathroom. The applicants are proposing six bedrooms and six and a half bathrooms in each unit. The property is zoned R4C, multiple family district, and is non-conforming for lot area, lot width, and setbacks. The subject property is within the Burns Park neighborhood south of East University Avenue on the west side of Prospect Street. The home was built in 1956 and is approximately 6,621 square feet in size. The applicants are seeking to alter the non-conforming structure by creating new habitable space in the basement and constructing a new second story that will comply with the 30-foot height restriction for the district. The new units will mirror one another. Some of the upgrades will be new window wells, fire-rated walls, and spray foam insulation to increase energy efficiency. The existing building will remain the same length and width and the height being the only exterior alteration. The adjacent properties are both three stories and approximately 30 feet in height. Moving to the PowerPoint. Uh, Kristen, are you there? 
It's saying yes, the, ho sorry. the host is disabled participant screen sharing. Yep, try again. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. The first slide is the zoning map. You see the highlighted parcel, the subject property, highlighted in yellow in the center of your screen on the west side of Prospect and um, east of Packard. The next slide is the um, aerial map showing surrounding properties and existing conditions. And the next slide is the zoomed in aerial photo of the subject property. The next slide is the survey that was submitted with the application. And as I said, it doesn't meet the lot area requirements, lot width or setbacks for the district. The next slide are the existing east and west and um, elevation drawings and a few reference photos. The next slide is a site plan and also new um, elevation drawings. The next slide is more elevation drawings. The next slide shows um, the proposed, or excuse me, the next slide <coughs> shows the existing layout of the um, existing structure and the existing um, basement. Next slide shows the proposed uh, one second, this is the proposed first floor, I believe that is. Can't read uh, the slides. because Yeah, that's first floor. So that's the first floor. And you see the living areas, the kitchen, dining room, and a bedroom. And as, as I previously stated, the, the units will mirror one, one another. Next slide is the new second floor and you see the um, new proposed bedrooms and bathrooms. Next slide shows the new proposed basement with additional bedrooms and bathrooms in the basement. These are the photos that I took uh, at my inspection. You see the front facade of the existing structure. Looking down the um, east side of the structure and the driveway side. This is the rear facade. This is looking at the rear facade, the driveway, and the adjacent um, property and the relationship between the two. And just the other side, the relationship between the other um, adjacent property. And like I said, you see the difference in height and the difference in massing. This is the existing parking lot in the rear of the property. And that is all I have at this time. And I will take any questions that you have. Thank you, John. Any questions? Todd. Yes, John, this came up once before and I have a note with the notice at home. It's sort of a crummy question to ask, but this is a non-conforming structure and there's some cap on given whatever the current market value is on how much money can be spent on an upgrade. Isn't that correct? And if so, if, have they exceeded this amount? No, that's when they're only going to destroy a structure. So ah, understood. Yep. Um, okay. if, they're gonna destroy, if they're going to destroy, if they're going to destroy or demolish, then there's a certain, but they're just going to um, rehab this. Um, Got it. Good. Yep. You avoided that one. Good. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions for John? All right, if the petitioner is ready, um, you may begin your presentation. You'll have five minutes.
You're silent. Hey, hey, Chris, we can't hear you right you're this time. You're silenced. You're muted. Can't hear you. Is that better? There we, we can go. hear you now. You can hear me now. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you for your consideration in this matter. I really do appreciate it. Um, so the, the property we have here, it's yeah, 1200 Prospect. It's currently a duplex. It's currently each side is two bedrooms, one bathroom, and then each side has via a common stairway into the basement, its own unfinished space for laundry that's actually equal square footage to the, the current living area. Um, the house, you know, it's, it's the original 1956 construction. Um, you know, it's, I think it's, it's, they would call that today if a, if a realtor were trying to sell it a mid-century modern, but usually those properties are a little bit nicer than this one, I would say. So, you know, it's, it's one, um, our company has actually managed it quite a, quite a bit longer, but they've owned it since 2005. Um, it, you know, we've had this in mind for some type of renovation ever since then. You know, it's an eyesore. I'm sure the neighbors are looking at this, like, what the heck is this little thing doing in our neighborhood? So they're probably uh, head over heels about the fact that, you know, we're, we're trying to give it quite a refurbishment and, and, you know, just an overall aesthetic improvement. Um, but, but anyway, so, so the property, as, as it stands right now, it's, you know, it, it's, it's very poorly insulated. Um, you know, back in 1956 when it was built, they, you know, energy costs were nothing. So they certainly uh, weren't as worried about making sure everything stayed in as they are nowadays. And it, you know, it has, it has a very leaky roof. I was told by the architect that the roof pitch is actually, uh, you know, either not up to code or just you are not able to get a warranty on that pitch anymore because it, you know, it's just obsolete. So there are quite a few structural deficits to it. And it's, it's a prime candidate for something that, you know, we can just really, really upgrade, uh, bring it up to modern code, modern standards, modern energy efficiency. And we're, we're certainly proud to be able to do that with this proposal. Um, so what we have here is we're going to keep the same two units. So, so it will remain a duplex. There, it's going to be three stories. So um, you're going to have, have a couple of bedrooms in the basement, which there's currently no living space. Um, these, the bedrooms in the basement, I'm looking at them too. You know, compared to, compared to you know, what, what I at least had when I was going to U of M back a while ago. But you know, you're living in a shoebox, and these bedrooms in the basement are each 286 square feet with their own private bathroom, full bathroom. So it's almost like each person gets their own apartment here. So it's quite an upgrade from the usual student experience that you know, I'm sure most people have dealt with in the past. Um, so you got two, two bedrooms in the basement, one on the, on the main floor along with kitchen, living room in each unit, which as, as John was saying, it's a mirror image. Um, bedroom on the main floor is still 174 square feet, which is more than twice as large as it needs to be. So, you know, and, and that also has its own bathroom. Um, and then, so, and in, in the top floor, there's, there's a balcony, a, a small balcony that goes outside, and then there's three bedrooms. They're each 172 square feet, 172 and 182 each with their own full bathroom. So, you know, these are, these are wonderful, uh, wonderful bedrooms. Uh, you know, we really designed this with the tenant experience in mind, just because, you know, nobody wants to live three people in a shoebox like they used to. And, uh, you know, I, I think people demand a little bit higher quality living situation nowadays, especially, you know, after COVID and after all the stuff we've had to deal with the last couple of years. So, um, what, what we're proposing here is that the construction for this updated unit um, it, at the bare minimum, in terms of energy efficiency, we're going to do spray foam throughout, spray foam on the roof. So it's going to be significantly more efficient than it currently is. You know, in its current form, it's one of those ones where even after it snows a foot, there's still no snow on the roof because the heat's just, you know, just going straight out of the roof and melting it right away. So we are, at the minimum, it's going to be spray foam. We are considering even upgrading that to, to SIPs paneling which is the, the, it's, it's the two piece of OSP with the, the thick foam between it. And that would be, you know, in terms of residential, that would be the ultimate energy efficiency. If that product, you know, there are a lot of issues with supply chain and everything right now, but if that product is available when we go to build this, say, I would say six months from now, that, that we'll actually explore into. And so, um, you know, and we're going to go energy efficient to appliances, everything, you know, is, is, is that we're doing this with energy efficiency in mind just because you know, it makes sense nowadays. So um, let's see here. And then in terms of like, the parking, we will, we will likely do, uh, you know, new concrete, new driveway, that kind of thing. Just just everything about it will be upgraded. The windows, 
it's going to, for, although it'll be a remodel, for it will, for all intents and purposes, it will be a brand new house. But obviously, it's you know, it's going to be a remodel. It's going to keep foundation. It's going to keep some of the other elements of it. But, Three seconds. Uh, let's see here. And then in terms of yeah, high efficiency washer, high efficiency furnace, uh, will likely go tankless water heater. So you know, it's really it's going to be everything's going to be very modern with it and. Um, you know, we'll, we'll really bring it from what it is, you know, just an eyesore in the neighborhood that doesn't really suit anything to, you know, it's going to be brought up to the modern standards. So um, that's all I have right now. I'm open to any questions if anyone has them. Thank you. Any questions for the petitioner? Dave. Um, that, it seems like an unusual design, one bathroom for every bedroom. And it makes me wonder, are you going to be renting these out as like SROs with a shared kitchen and living space? No, are no. You... no so, so this, this neighborhood, uh, so, so we actually I'm manage... familiar with the neighborhood. I walk down the street like every day almost. Oh, excellent. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's so it, this is, it's, it's very student heavy. I, I think maybe there are a couple houses there down toward the end of Prospect that maybe that do not have students, but um, no, the, the, we were a, were a student landlord. We don't. I don't have any kind of interest in doing short, you know, short-term rental, rental by the room. It's that's oh. more hassle than it's worth in a lot of cases. Um, but there's, you know, and I've seen it. So I also sell real estate in Ann Arbor here, and my clients do a lot of development similar to this. There's a very high demand for this exact type of product with the students. And no, they're leasing it as one one master lease for it. And you know they, they just love the fact that everyone has their own bathroom. But no, there's we we don't have any interest in doing you know six leases or you know renting it short term. That that's just not in our wheelhouse. Okay, thank you, Chris. Um, you said you're going to rebuild the parking, and I'm wondering if you're going to be putting in any EV or if even that's a requirement in this situation. You know, so so one of the, I, I'm glad that you brought that up. Um, so it's I, I don't believe we have any plans to do that right away. However, the the reason for that is that the specific tenant right now that would be interested in this building, or you know, say a year from now when it when it comes to fruition, um, I, I we haven't seen as much absorption of of the EV. You know, we manage. 120, 150 units, and we haven't seen as much of the EV absorption into this specific market yet. However, we are obviously, you know, in the future, say five years from now, when when EVs are, you know, 600% of what they are right now, we're absolutely open to the idea of of incorporating charging stations into this 100%. That's that's certainly that certainly that that aligns with our values as well as what we would like to have our tenants um, doing as well. So because right now is the cheapest time to put it in. When you're redoing oh, okay. the, the driveway, I, I can also add to that. Um, so it's a duplex, and each unit requires 1.5 spaces. So the total pro property would require three spaces. There's more than three spaces in the rear yard now. It's existing, non conforming. They meet the requirements and exceed it, actually. And then also, the EV parking is not required for this project. All right. Thank you. Any other questions for the petitioner? One more. Dave? So it looks to me like it's a brick exterior, and our staff has said that it's not going to be a tear down and rebuild, but you're using the existing structure. But the little drawing seems that it's more of a different siding than the brick, and I'm just wondering how you're, are you, I mean, you're yeah, building so, so a second it, it, floor. You're building a whole new second floor. What are you do? What are you doing? Are you extending the brick up, or how are you doing? This? So, so how I had the architect um, do do these these diagrams is with vinyl siding, just because you know I, I I think we would have trouble matching that type of brick that's on there right now to 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 put a second story and then and then obviously the roof pitch above it. Um, it's, you know, I, I think that at this point, the vinyl, you know, you, they, they have a very attractive product in a lot of cases, and, and we can do that either over the brick or, or we can, you know, just strip the brick off while maintaining the wall and then, and then just put new vinyl siding there. So the, there are ways we can, you know, incorporate that into it. But, you know, this, this design, this would be vinyl is how we have it right now. We may go higher with a cement fiber board. Or, or, or an even higher quality exterior product. You know, like I said, it depends on what is available in the market when we go to do this, as there are shortages with a lot of this stuff. But 
Um, it, how these are drawn, we can, we'll, we can either do the vinyl on top of the brick or we can remove the brick and just do the vinyl all the way up. So. But it wouldn't, it wouldn't, re uh, it wouldn't require um, tearing down any full walls or anything. Brick is just, you know, kind of an exterior covering. Any other questions? All right, thank you. If there is anyone from the public who wishes to speak on this petition, if you are in person, please come forward now. If you are accessing the meeting remotely, um, please press star nine to raise your hand. Or yes, please press star nine or use the raise hand um, function if you're viewing through the web link. No callers have indicated. Thank you, Kristen. I will note that we did not receive any letters of communication regarding this petition. So with that, the public hearing is closed and we are in discussion. Todd. Well, this is the uh, easier one. It's a non-conforming structure and uh, the applicant described it very well. It's an enormous improvement consistent with the changes in tastes and uh, student desires and the market. And for me, this is an easy yes. Elizabeth. I agree with Todd. I mean, this is a, it's a really nice situation where they have adequate parking and like it's an underutilization of the space to have it only be a one-story building is, is kind of silly in this part of town. So this is, I, I have no problem supporting this. This is really good. Any further discussion? Are we ready for a motion? I could, I'll make a motion. Thank if you, I Dave. have a motion to ZBA 22-006, 1200 Prospect Street, alteration to a non-conforming structure. The Zoning Board of Appeals hereby grants relief from section 5.32.2 alteration to a non-conforming structure to allow new habitable space in the basement and construct a second story to the existing non-conforming duplex. The new structure will contain two units with six bedrooms and six and a half bathrooms in each unit. The building footprint and setbacks remain unchanged with no additional encroachments. The construction must comply with the submitted plans. A motion to have support from Chris, thank you. Mike Daniel. Yes. Dave Devardi. Devardi, yes. Chris Fraley. Yes. Todd Grant. Yes. Elizabeth Nelson. Yes. Chris Madigan. Yes. I also vote yes. The request is granted. Thank you. Moving on to petition ZBA 22-0071031 Broadway Street. John? Thank you, Candace. Lower Town Proper LLC is seeking a nine, nine parking space variance from table 5.19-1 off street parking. The existing vacant business space is to be converted to a cafe and bar. The building is 1,395 square feet in size, which requires 14 off-street parking spaces for a restaurant and bar use. The property is zoned C3 Fringe Commercial District. The subject property is located at the intersection of Broadway Street and Moore Street in the Lower, Ta Lower Town District neighborhood. <coughs> the building was constructed in 1938 according to the city's assessor's records. The parcel is 5,619 square feet in area. There is an attached convenience store on the west side of the building. The store is part of a different parcel with their own parking area. The applicants are in the process of renovating the vacant commercial property to a new bar and cafe. When the renovations are completed, the business would accommodate a maximum of 50 occupants. There is a planned outdoor seating area with bench and lounge seating. The business has most recently been utilized as a barber shop and bicycle repair shop. The previous uses had a parking ratio requirement of one space per 280 square feet that required six and five spaces respectively. The existing non-conforming parking lot contains only five spaces. The applicants are trying to capture the walkability component of this unique area that is surrounded by a neighborhood to the north and the new Beekman on Broadway development on the other side of the in in intersection that is under construction. Before I go any further, I just wanted to um, bring attention to the bottom of the staff report and on your motion worksheet. Um, for a parking variance, you see the requirements listed there. 
they don't have to meet the regular uh, variance of the five um, criteria and uh, like in a residential variance. So you see that in the bottom of the staff report. Is your staff report full? And on the motion worksheet. John? Yes. Do you have, is this correct or was this printed wrong? That's correct. Okay. The first slide in the PowerPoint is the location map. You see the subject property highlighted in yellow in the center of your screen. You see it's at the intersection of Broadway and Moore Street. The next slide is the area map showing surrounding neighborhoods and existing conditions. The next slide is the zoomed in aerial photo and you see the um, parking spaces that I described in the back, the five spaces back here, and then the adjacent property with the convenience store and their parcel that kind of circumvents or surrounds the existing subject property. The next slide is the survey that was submitted with the application. The next slide is the site plan. You see it's the um, oriented with the parking spaces back here and proposed outdoor seating areas and some of the internal components of the, the business. These are the photos that the applicant submitted with their application. Some of the exterior photographs of the property and how it currently exists. the rear of the property. Some of these are the interior photos. These are my photos that I took when I made my inspection of the property. You see the existing five parking spaces and some more photos that I took from the exterior of the building. looking um, down, down Moore Street and the sidewalk, the public right of way and some of their open space in front of the property, in front of the building, excuse me. Looking across the street at some of the development across the street, existing development across the street. And these next slides were submitted by the applicant, conceptual photos of some interior um, space and what they're proposing to the finished product to um, look like. and an exterior rendering. That's all I have for my presentation. I'll take any questions that you have at this time. Thank you, John. Any questions? Chris. Um, I just had, it's not even necessarily related to the reduction in spaces, but I think it might affect the request. Um, so the proposed site plan doesn't show any barrier free spaces. Um, but I, it seems like just based on um, section 5.19.7 of the UDC that um, they would have to be in compliance with the applicable requirements for that. And so I think that means that they'd have to have at least one with the access aisle beside it. Um, so I just, you know, depending on how, if that's relevant and how it's accomplished, I guess it could affect the number of spaces they actually have. Yep. Um, so that'll be, uh, they'll have to supply that and satisfy that when they submit their building permits and the building officials will apply the ADA requirements during that time. Yeah, no, and I totally understand we're not here to, to yep. approve a site plan. I just, yep. just given that they may be required to use one of those existing place, you know, it was just something that crossed my mind as I was looking at it. That's a yep, very good point. <laughs> Any other questions for John? Dave. I'm, <clears throat> I'm familiar with this. My son used to be a short order cook over there at Northside Grill, and I've eaten there many times and parked at this one of the, some of these adjacent sites. And I know that party store, and I've talked to Jim Coley, the owner of Northside Grill, a few times who's had a desire to 
acquired. I'm just curious. It looks like the building, the party store building, is a separate parcel from the big parking lot adjacent to it. Is that accurate? It, yeah, according to our GIS, it appears that way. But I think that that property owns both parcels. I think so, too. Yep. yep. But it's just looking like there's the two parcels. Okay, that was just a simple question I had. Todd. Um, to further emphasize what John said, I'm, I'm very familiar with this spot. I have my bicycles repaired at Seat Transit. Um, when they were in this space and at their new space, and I've bicycled and walked and driven by it. And um, the old barbershop space, this current space that's being worked on, is separate from the party store. True. Yeah. Yeah, I know. And I would also add that parking is really tight right now as it is, but we'll get to that discussion later. Any other questions <clears throat> for John? Okay. Elizabeth. I'm probably less familiar with this part of town than others. Um, I'm curious, like, North Side, does North Side Grill comply with the parking requirements for a space like this? Painfully, yes. Um, I mean, I know North Side Grill is like one next a, door. That's a good question. I can't see it. It's the next two couple properties over, and I didn't look, but even if it doesn't, I'm sure the North Side Grill's parking is not conforming. It's okay. Been, it's yeah. been there so long. I mean, that's yeah. kind of what I'm figuring. Yeah. Like, I'm yeah. I'm just looking at this part of town, and this is like Most a bunch of people are just used to like walking to destinations here. And yep. like Todd, I've taken my bike to get repaired at sick <laughs> right there. Yeah. I think everything is probably non-conforming in, in that area of town. Yeah. It was, it was all constructed so long ago. Okay. And then Thanks. you've got the new stuff across the street, so it's kind of a blend of both. I I believe what happened with the uh, old gas station there. The, the city offered Coley the south part of the part, what is now his parking area, because technically it was a street, but it, in, and when it got repaved, this sort of changed, and I'm not sure how, but I remember speaking with Jim Coley about that, um, and it allowed him to become closer to his requirements for parking. Um, but I, I believe it's still a non-conforming situation there, but that's also a separate discussion. Yeah. It's not a discussion here. So, but it sort of is because they, this site can use some of that space when Coley's closed because this is gonna be a pub, more, I'm imagining more of an evening situation. So there's, there's some give and take on that parking that will more than likely happen. I've discussed that with the applicant, and I think they might touch on that when they come to the podium. So. Very good, thank you. Dave, did you have another question? Uh, I was gonna, my familiarity with the, the situation is behind Northside Grill, I mean, if you look at the big section, there's a parcel there that's kind of odd shape that um, is along the end of Pontiac Trail and on Swift. Yeah. And that entire thing, GM owns that, and that's all yeah. north side grill parking. And then the building to the, what is that, northwest? Where's the? To Out of the, town on Broadway. To the northeast, towards uh, Traver and uh, Plymouth Road. Jim acquired that building, and he uses that for parking as well. So that there's... I've always found sufficient parking there, even on Sunday mornings, between all of those parcels. And I'm not sure if they're, the parking provided on those is directly linked by to his business, but he owns the property and that's how he uses that property is for parking. Any other questions? All right, if the applicant is ready, um, you may please state your name for the record and then um, you'll have five minutes. Can I take the mask off? I'm up for it. I'll leave it on, it's fine. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Pete Baker. I'm here with my partners, um, Joe Bollinger, who occupied this building until last summer as the owner of Sick Transit Cycle and is now still thriving on the other side of the block uh, in the St. Vincent de Paul building and our other partner, Hubert Raglan, who bought the building uh, last summer when Sick Transit moved out. 
as well as Alicia Deschard uh, from E&D Studio in Detroit, who's our architect on the project, and did all these great drawings for us that were submitted. Um, by way of background, real quick, I've been involved in local businesses and organizations for, for decades in Ann Arbor. I started as a, I started an arts and crafts festival called Tiny Expo, um, which is still going about 10 years on at the downtown library, but we started that festival an avant-garde film night, a series of pop-up gallery shows in an unoccupied building on Braun Court, which then became, because of some of these events, became the bar at Braun Court. I had a letterpress studio on Beal, in the Beale building on Felt Street, alongside a bunch of woodworkers, uh, toy makers, some arborists, before that became the apartment building that it is now. I was with Duo Security um, as the head of design and marketing. Early on from the shared office space we had up at the Tech Brewery, before we moved downtown and occupied two full buildings there that we, that we rehabbed uh, that, that are still in use. Uh, I also worked with Eve Aronoff on Frida Batidos and designed her interior and branding and all that. And I've been uh, the board chair of the Ann Arbor Art Center for the past uh, about seven years, including during its expansion into the new building that is under renovation right now. My point, all saying, in, in, my point in saying all this is that one of the things that all these uh, places had in common that they all benefited from, uh, and in the case of Duo, actually fully recruited based on the walkability and proximity to other businesses and the density that came from that. In all of the conversations about opening, expanding, or placing these businesses, the focus on downtown was intense and, and immense. There was simply no other commercial corridor that provided the, the same number of nearby residents and uh, businesses, as well as without being a primarily car dependent area, which was a really, really big factor for every one of these businesses. So the thing about Lower Town is it's, it's very unique. Uh, as, as mentioned, it's, it's one of the, it's the oldest area of Ann Arbor. Uh, Sick Transit occupies the oldest commercial building in Ann Arbor right now. It's partly why the block wasn't uh, built to accommodate the kind of parking requirements uh, here. It was built before, par before cars were a thing. Uh, so it, it simply can't comply with, with some of the modern uh, zoning for that block. The proper center of this neighborhood, which is partly where the name comes from, Lower Town Proper, it's sandwiched between a large employee center, Michigan Medicine, two sizable single family home residential areas, plus over 1,500 apartments, Kitty Corner and across the, uh, the other way, as well as the DT River Project going in and a whole bunch of river activities with Argo Cascades and, and the livery there. Uh, but as close as it is to downtown, the, the physical and psychological barrier of the bridge actually creates uh, a lot of sort of underserved opportunity there. Um, the distance the other direction to the strip mall sort of up along North Campus is over a mile and a half. It's along not a terribly pedestrian friendly area, so it's just sort of it's a very separated uh, area there. And within a half a mile of this building, we have over 128 units at Shoreline, 620 going up at the Beekman, and seven other apartment complexes around there that add up to over 15, 1,600 units within a half a mile of us. Uh, not to mention the, uh, the parking nearby, as well as uh, the neighborhood of about, we estimated about 13,000 within one mile of us not going over the river, just in the other direction. Um, and about 22,000 employees regularly at the hospital, just you know, a quarter mile away. As far as the parking goes, uh, directly across the street, there's 300 public UMish parking spots. There's another 480 employee spaces. Uh, the neighborhood up Pontiac Trails lined with street parking. Uh, we, we have spoken with, with Jim. Uh, we have a letter of support from him, Jim from Northside. He's Joe's landlord at Sick Transit. He's totally open to us using the parking lot when Northside is closed. There's not a lot over that. We will have a cafe in the morning. Not a ton of traffic needs for that. Um, the, other, the other factor here is the Broadway Bridge is the central artery for all non-car traffic, which is another unique spot, aspect of that. Cycling, walking, it all funnels through our front door. Uh, and across that bridge. And we're talking about a small bar. Uh, it's a creative reuse project that's gonna add some real charm to that, that corner in that neighborhood, but it's a small one, like you, know, like you said, 50, 60 people on a good day. Uh, so the group bike rides meeting at Sick Transit every weekend would 
fill us to capacity when they when they finish up. Like we simply uh, don't have the capacity to handle more than a, a typical afternoon's coffee coffee run. Uh, I don't, so we I, we really want to help foster a higher density mixed use area to start. <clears throat> Achieving the goals of the A20 uh, program, we're, we're simply a neighborhood cafe and bar serving the, the neighborhood people who are already there. That's all I've got. Thanks. Thank you. You're at almost six minutes now, so you're over, but oh, I'll sorry. let you, you, you can, you can okay. make it brief, please. <laughs> Thanks, Pete. She can speak to technicality much better. Yeah, and so, and so thank you, Pete, for a great overview of the vision and why we all, as the design team and the owners team, feel like it's in harmony with the spirit of both kind of the Ann Arbor zoning and, and overall development that's happening in Lower Town right now, um, especially all of the development that's happening across the street. But just also to kind of repeat or go back to what John was talking about and what some of the questions that have been asked have been about, which is that this situation that we are requesting the variance for is unique to Lower Town, right? As a C3 fringe commercial district, it's unique in its form. It's built more like a historic downtown, whereas that district is typically strip malls and freestanding restaurants and things like that. Um, and so it is really, it's not a condition that um, is even unique to the reuse as a cafe and bar, um, but is unique to kind of any reuse that we would like to put or that anyone would like to put there. Um, for reference, if, if a new use were to, um, to use only the existing five spots, it would have to be a use with over 280 square feet per spot, which is an extremely limited list, right? It's like offices and, um, you know, it obviates a lot of potentially beneficial uses for the neighborhood that will really kind of create a new downtown atmosphere there. And also, it's a bar and cafe, right? So we think about ride sharing, we think about biking to, that, uh, to the location. We're uh, providing at least 14 bike parking spaces. Um, and so really promoting that as part of the culture of the, um, of the business. And also, uh, as you saw on the site plan, we really plan to redesign that front corner, redo the landscaping, make it a kind of public amenity space where you could take out a, caf a coffee and sit um, in some nice Adirondack chairs, nice landscaping, and really bring a lot of life to that corner that has been empty for a couple of years now and kind of underutilized. Um, so thank you very much for your time. Sorry for going over. Thanks. Thank you. And any you are welcome to any questions. Questions for the petitioners. Todd. Uh, yes, so I have one question, Mr. Baker, and um, you partly answered it because uh, Mr. Bollinger, the owner of Sea Transit Cycles, you said is here. Uh -huh. I don't know which, I'll take your word for it, I've not met him. Right or maybe there. I have, but I haven't. Right, right Hi there. So I, I brought my bikes to Sea Transit Cycle, and a couple of times I had to come back because the parking lot was full. And the problem I have, you've obviously talked with his owner, but I don't know about Northside Grill is there's already a shortage of parking places there. And I agree they need more food establishments here because of otherwise if it's not Northside Grill, you're looking at Angelo's. Mm -hmm. But I don't know how they hack the different owners, the party store, Northside Grill, Seek Transit, and now your business are gonna fight over the all too few parking spaces. And there's some other spots where the parking was screwed up. And I'm thinking of the Whole Foods at the corner of Wasada and Huron. Mm -hmm. where you go there at certain times and there simply aren't parking spaces. So I like getting my bikes there, but if it's a routine repair and I can't get into there, I'm gonna go somewhere else. And realistically, I'm not gonna eat there because I'm in the northeast part of Ann Arbor. So I hate to throw a damper on, I think a business that's needed, a new eating place, mm -hmm. but you've got a hell of a parking problem. And maybe you need to erect barbed wire fences between the different ownership lots. <laughs> or invest in some Denver boots. But yeah, I'm telling um, you, I'm going to be an unhappy customer if I can't get my bike in and I've got to come back again. Sure, sure. And uh, if I'm bringing my bike in to get repaired, I'm obviously taking it on my car. I could walk back to my house, but I prefer not to. Yeah. So you got a problem. I'm not yeah, saying I'm going to vote no, but... And I understand being involved in Brian Court and stuff are all wonderful medals to have in your chest, and that's great. But you got a parking problem. So uh, the difference I would say with uh, dropping a bike off for repair at, at Sick Transit is you're leaving your mode of transportation there. You need a way to get back. It, this is more of a destination process for you because there's only so many bike shops around town, right? And you, you prefer that one, as I do too. It's an excellent bike shop. It's a great bike shop. I, I know it well. Um, 
so, so that's one of few options for you there. And to your point on if there's not parking uh, for this cafe, you'll go somewhere else. We're comfortable and ready for that. You know, we, we can only accommodate so many people. We're, we will be at capacity if simply the 50 people of the 13,000 that live up the street come by every day. So we, we are not expecting any fights over parking. We frankly can't handle too many more people. So if, if Northside fills up with parking just for us, we're, we're, we're tapped out. So, so yeah, we are, we are looking at this as not serving as a destination, but as a neighborhood spot. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. We'll get to public yeah. comment in a minute, okay. and then Sorry. he can speak. Oh, he's one of the owners. He's one. He is a partner. Yeah. Let's. We'll okay. give it just cool. a minute. <laughs> Any other questions for the petitioner? Right now. Okay. Now I'll open up the public hearing. <laughs> if there's anyone else who wishes to speak, please come forward. Um, all right, so I need to put a name oh, on this as well. Please, um, please state your name. Please, yeah, state your name for the record, and My then you'll have three Mark minutes. He's Meyer Hook. I own the house at 723 Moore Street, which is, they've talked a lot about across the street. I am across the street. Um, so I um, know this property and this, this location really well, and I would love to see it revitalized. Um, let me start state that first. Um, but I am concerned about the parking. There are eight parking spots on Moore Street. They are 24-hour spots. There is no residential permit. The houses on Moore Street um, do not need these spots, except for mine. My house is the seventh oldest home in Ann Arbor. It does not have a driveway, and it has six residents. And so they park in front of that spot, and they have for the time I've owned it since 1998, fought against the people from the hospital who also park in those spots, which fill up very quickly in the morning and come and go through the day. But we are facing the fact that people drive to cafes, they drive to bars, and yes, it is a walkable area with good population density, but a lot of times people still take their car to go get their coffee or they take their car to drive their friends to the bar. So um, I realize it's not that many people, but they're going to spill out of their parking lot and into the eight spots on Moore Street, which doesn't seem like a big deal. But it will be a big deal to my six residents. And I'd like you to consider that in um, granting a parking variance that um, that will greatly impact those people's lives. Um, it will also spill up Traver, which has four hour parking, which expires at six o'clock. So that would be free parking for that area as well. Um, and it's fine as long as my residents can find parking, but um, that will go back blocks and blocks and blocks according to how busy the, the establishment gets. So they will be parking further and further and further away from the house um, since we are the corner house of Traver Street and Moore Street. Um, and um, being now a historic property, I don't know what the requirements are in terms of my, my ability to put in a driveway, um, but that ship may have sailed. You know, I've now owned it for well over 20 years and we've never had a problem, but you know, perhaps I have to stand in front of you and and plead my case for a driveway at some point if this were to um, proceed. I just uh, hope that they can come up with a creative solution to maybe buy slot, uh, spots from, from the surrounding businesses or um, from the, the apartments next door, um, but um, they, they need to secure the number of spots that um, would satisfy their customers and please, please, please protect more street parking. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes I, to? At the end of all the Hello. comments, you can. Hello. Yes, please state your name for the record, and then you'll have three minutes. My name is Joe Bollinger. I'm the owner of Sick Transit Cycles, which is one of the nearby adjacent uh, businesses. And um, I'd like to respond to Todd's comment earlier about the conflict between the parking at Lower Town Proper and the parking at Sick Transit Cycles. And it does seem like there is a parking problem down there, but it's 
you know, I'm down there every day and I see the whole thing develop and <clears throat> the parking problem is really, it's, it's short lived. It's like when the north side grill is at its peak, there is a parking problem there. But the north side grill, when it's at its peak, right across the street um, is this like 300 spaces of like public university lot that's Saturdays and Sundays and evenings as well. And I also don't believe that there's going to be a big problem because there's not going to be a lot of overlap in hours. Northside Grill closes at 3 o'clock. Sick Transit Cycles closes at 6 o'clock. And probably Lower Town Proper will not be peaking until in the evening after 6 o'clock. So I don't think there's going to be a, a big conflict. But it's something that I've taken into consideration. Thank you. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Is there anyone else here in person who wishes to speak regarding this petition? All right, if there is anyone remotely who wishes to speak on this petition, please call in now and press star nine. Um, if you're accessing via the web link, please use the raise hand feature and staff will call on you. Caller ending at 534. You'll have three minutes to address the ZBA. Good evening, my name is Tom Stalberg. I live in Lower Town at 1202 Traver Street, which is the oldest schoolhouse still standing in Ann Arbor. Lower Town is an amazing place. It is the highest concentration of the oldest homes and buildings in all of town that are left. It's an amazingly walkable neighborhood. The number of residents here, apartment buildings, condo buildings, homes, duplexes, uh, lots of them rental, Lots of motor occupied as well. The anybody coming from anywhere else is going to have a hard time finding a spot not to park, but in the bar. There are so many people that live in short walking distance to this. Um, I could go on and on about how wonderful the neighborhood is, uh, but I invite you down to Lower Town proper after it gets going, and we can talk history because I'm an amateur historian. We can talk, we can play some euchre. Uh, this is the neighborhood bar. That's what this is going to be. Uh, across the street, there's a large development. They're putting in a thousand new residents, and they've only got uh, the size of commercial space that's the equivalent of, of a Panera that's going to go in in that uh, Beekman area. Uh, it's kind of a shame and a sham. Uh, and they use the parking units to get down from uh, less than they asked for. Um, they're going to make it work. Uh, we have Broadway uh, Park West that's going to have 100 condos and a hotel uh, just walking distance uh, right on the Broadway Bridge. We've got the Cascades, we've got the new tunnel, so people walking uh, from Main Street will be have easy access to this. And then there's all of us that are already in here that would love to just stroll on down there. I walk down to the North Side Grill all the time. Um, so this is a walkable business, majority. Uh, people in my immediate neighborhood, uh, the, the resident on the corner of Moore and Traver, I, I'd like to get it, to know him. Uh, but if you look in your packet, there's a bunch of letters from people who live up Traver. Uh, and we're all really looking forward to this. Uh, we do have four hour parking uh, resident permit situation here on Traver. And maybe we could get that gentleman and the other people on Moore Street to uh, be added on to our parking program. And maybe the, the hours on the parking program can be uh, tinkered with as well. Uh, so that it will accommodate those residents. Uh, the idea is to not to, to inconvenience the immediate residents. So I, I hope that we can work that out. And uh, uh, Joe Bollinger has uh, my, my number and email if that resident uh, wants to work with our neighborhood. Um, my nearby resident, uh, Mary, who set up that parking, she was the one who worked with the city to get the parking in place. Uh, she's in support of this project as well and wrote me a letter. So hopefully we residents can all work together and solve that issue for that gentleman and his tenants. Thank you. Thank you. Caller ending in 719. You'll have three minutes to address the ZBA. Can you hear me? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we yes. can hear you. Okay, 
Wonderful, thank you. Um, so my name is Bethany Oxender, and my husband and I and our daughter live on 703 Moore Street. Um, so that is right down the street from where this is, the proposal is. And first I just want to say we 100% support it. We were very excited when we got the invitation to this meeting under our door. We think the Lower Town area is absolutely fantastic. There's so much history here, completely underutilized. I'm going to echo everything he said about the tra foot, foot traffic that is used because I see every single day the people walking to work. I myself am a hospital worker that walks to work and then in the summer it is equally as busy. Anyway, with all that said, um, with the parking, I, I agree. I won't repeat what everyone else has said, but um, you know, if we ever have people over to our home, we want them to use these spots in front of more. And if they're going to use that for, you know, somewhere else, and that, you know, kind of takes away area for our family, which is a bit of an inconvenience. Um, but I just wanted to throw this idea out there because I don't know if anyone is aware, but there was a study done, the Ann Arbor Lower Town Area Mobility Study, and it just got reported on about five days ago. And it was the planning consultant OHM group. And we plan to go to the meeting on April 20th of transportation. But they want to put a roundabout um, on Pontiac, Swift, Moore, and Longshore. Very needed, very needed, especially for um, pedestrian safety. So that'll be nice for this. But they're considering Moore being a two-way street, but we strongly feel if you keep it a one, and then we can somehow get them to do another row of parking on the other side of Moore, um, that would be great for businesses like this because we want these businesses. We really do. That's why we moved here. Um, so I just wanted to like throw that out there, and if anyone talks to anyone in the transportation planning, consider it because that would be a, a great opportunity to add more parking here, and one way that a neighborhood folk can not be affected by the new businesses coming. That's all I got. Thank you. There are no other callers. Thank you, Kristen. I will note that we received several letters of support from surrounding neighbors um, at 1002 Pontiac Trail, North Ann Arbor, 1320 Traver Road, 1303 Pearl Street, 1223 Traver, 2435 Prairie Street, 1219 Traver Road, 1508 Traver, 400 Virginia Avenue, and also from Jim Coley, the owner of Northside Rail Coley Enterprises LLC and BFTH LLC. With that, the public hearing is closed and we are in discussion. Um, Chris. Yeah, I used to be a neighbor myself at 1123 Pontiac Trail, and I know the neighborhood intimately. Um, I know what those problems are. I had been attempting to put a pub in the old gas station. Um, I know what the parking variance needs are. I understand this. I've heard all of, I, I know all of the numbers and with the expansion that's happening down, you know, in the old lower town space, you know, all it does is increase density and it's a darn toot and shame there hasn't been a pub there for a while. Um, I also feel your pain about parking. Um, I lost my parking in front of my house, which seems silly because if you want to slow down traffic, you put more parking in and you know we didn't need to lose that traffic or that that parking um i i wholeheartedly support this i love the idea of a one-way street that has one lane and has parking on both sides of moore street that's a brilliant idea um i i i desperately want to see a pub in lower town i think this is a this is a wonderful thing and i will be voting for this Okay. Um, I have a question for our staff. Looking at this map, um, I do want to note that the outpouring of support for this from the neighborhood, and but the one resident on Moore Street who doesn't have a driveway because of the age of his home. What, um, John, what would the policy be? I see a little notch there on, it, on Traver Street 
on that parcel, would it be realistic for him to be able to put a drive in there? That's city. That's city uh, owned right away. No, right. Are you, are you looking at this here? Yep. So there's... There's a little slice of a sliver of land next to his parcel? No. His parcel is not a rectangle. So the corner that would oh, you're be a traver is yeah. uh, kind of cut off there. But it strikes me that that could provide frontage for a drive coming off a traver into his parcel. He would have to, uh, if he wanted to do that, he would make an application for a right-of-way permit and um, get it reviewed through our engineering department. But that could be a possibility for him to solve his problems. I'm not saying that we can guarantee anything, but it's... It's a possibility he has the right to apply or uh, consult with the engineering department about the possibility of that, yes. And is that an administrative decision? Could it that... Had, well, it's administrative if it meets all the requirements of the engineering code. For a, a driveway and a new curb cut along that that because he there. has no driveway at all and it seems like it would be in the interest of the city to allow him to have a drive to bring resident parking off again that's something between he'd have to consult with the engineering department okay before. well i would certainly write a letter in support of that um, but i do want to note that there's a big a significant weight of support for this um that uh is convincing to me another issue that's convincing to me is i'm not sure how many years ago three or four years ago we had a parking variance for the big development at maiden lane and broadway the, that lower town development it's across Ask, the street the beacon on broadway yeah, yeah asking for 60 spaces of variance mm -hmm. which i characterized at the time as a three million dollar fifty thousand dollars a space giveaway to the developer by granting that variance i voted against the variance the variance passed so basically as public policy we gave that developer a three million dollar variance by my analysis when they were already building a parking structure they could have easily added more spaces with another floor and the scope of that development could have easily sustained um, and amortize the cost of those spaces over the entire development. Um, and I voted against that variance, but this board in its wisdom, by a slim majority, gave that variance. Now this small uh, property owner and a small business concept comes in asking for what I would characterize as a modest variance to bring something that would be an asset not only to the immediate neighborhood, but an asset to the city. In this case, I'm going to vote for the variance. But I just want to make clear that this board, in its wisdom, gave that $3 million variance in the same neighborhood to give away, six, not require 60 spaces of this major developer. Now I think it's incumbent on us, on, in the interest of supporting small business people, that we support this variance. I'll support that. Yes, I, I also, um, as usual, Dave, Dave has some excellent comments, and I too voted against the variance for the large development. And I thought it was a mistake at the time, but Dave and I did not win that decision. Getting to the point here, I'm going to vote for this. My initial concern was that. Mr. Baker had come in without consulting with the other owners, but obviously the presence of Mr. Bollinger um, ameliorates that objection. And I, I think there's an overwhelming need for a food establishment here. We've forgotten about Casey's, of course, that's a walk over the bridge, but there's Angelo's, Northside Grill, but there's more food establishments needed here. Um, and I don't want to put a, a damper on what I think will be a very nice business, something that I could bicycle to. Um, but I think they are, uh, Mr. Baker does understand they do have a tight situation. I appreciate Mr. Bollinger's comments. The next time I schedule an appointment, it won't be during lunch when everybody's at Northside. <laughs> um, but uh, I'm going to vote for it. And I also appreciate uh, 
Chris Fairley's comment that it, it is a, this is a need for this part of town. I don't want to um, make the project difficult by voting against the parking variance. So I will be supporting this. Elizabeth. I'm happy to support this. Um, I think some of the conversations we're having around adding a use to an area where there are already pinch points with parking, we have solutions for that. And, and I've heard these arguments before and um, quite often they don't come to fruition. You know, we'll have conversations about fears that the neighbors have about losing on street parking and the anxiety around that. Um, and we talk about a potential solution about residential permits and, and you know, ultimately it's just not as big a deal. And um, the idea of the, this parking not being adequate or being, there not being enough or people not going there because the parking lot is full. Well, I mean, that's kind of a good problem. Um, particularly when it's so close to so much residential and people who can walk to it. Um, I mean, if people are deterred from coming here because there's not a parking spot, um, that's kind of okay with me. I think the, the sort of the bigger tragedy is acres and acres of parking lot that are empty a lot. <laughs> like when you go to a place and you're, you're confident you're gonna find a spot, that means we've got a lot of extra pavement that's just sitting around and empty all the time and that's not great. So um, I'm really happy for the neighborhood that they're getting this amenity. I've got a handful of places that are like walkable to my house that are like this and I, I just love it and I think more neighborhoods in town should have places like this nearby. Thanks. Chris. Uh, so I just really want quickly want to circle back to why I brought up the barrier free thing um, and I'll just preface this by saying I support the variance. Um, my concern was is that strict compliance with the ADA requirement is going to require an eight foot striped area for your first ADA spot and one is all you're going to need. So my concern was that you're going to have to use one of those existing spaces for that striped area when you get to the building department review. And so your request might not actually be adequate. You might need a variance of one more spot. So that's why I brought it up. Uh, but that doesn't mean that there isn't a solution to it. Um, you know, you may be able to add it the other end where it looks like there's space that may be in compliance in it and it won't come up at all. Um, but I just, you know, um, I, I think the variance is, is fine and acceptable and modest. Um, and, and parking in, in a public place across the street or around the corner or whatever is not an issue for a lot of us, but obviously for people with mobility issues, that isn't always an option. And so just careful to, to make sure you, you get it in there when you submit it for review um, because, you know, obviously we want everyone we can to be able to come. So, um, but yeah, I, I think it is a great addition and I support it. Quick addendum, and I, I don't want to talk out of school here as a uh, ZBA member who's uh, offering advice, but it seems to me that there might be a discussion, uh, sir, with the AAATA about repositioning the spot that's right in front of your house because that's probably two spots at least worth of space that could be parking. They have to stop at the top of the hill anyway. And it's, it's, I think that still puts them within the dimensions of their stop spacing that would be valid. Um, and that might be a discussion also, just another methodology of increasing on-street parking. There's, there's, a, there's a stop right across the street from north side, the front door of Northside Grill. There's another stop at Bowen and Pontiac Trail. So, you know, that spot, I don't know how much traffic that, that, that stop gets, but it might be a discussion with the AATA. That's a good idea. I think the neighborhood parking permits really the only way that will reserve those spots for the people in the house. That, that has, it comes with its own Pandora's box. <laughs> I could, I'm ready for a motion if you'd like. I think, yeah, I think we're ready. ZBA 22-007, 1031 Broadway Street. Based on the following findings and in accordance with the established standards for approval, the Zoning Board of Appeals hereby grants a five parking space variance from Chapter 55, Unified Development Code, Table 5.19-1, off-street parking. 
the applicant is seeking to convert an existing vacant business to a bar and cafe. The property requires 14 parking spaces. The, the, this renovation requires a nine, nine parking space variance. It's, yeah, so it's, I want to put nine. That's a typo, sorry. Yeah, I, I'm sorry there was a typo here. Bo the Zoning Board of Appeals hereby grants a nine parking space variance from Chapter 55, Unified Development Code, Table 5.19-1, Off-Street Parking. The applicant is seeking to convert an existing vacant business to a bar and cafe. The property requires 14 parking spaces. This renovation requires a nine parking space variance. I have a motion to support. 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 Thank you, Chris. Todd. Yes. Elizabeth. Yes. Chris Madigan. Yes. I also vote yes. Mike Daniel. Yes. Dave Devardi. Devardi, yes. Chris Fraley. Very much so, yes. The request is granted. Moving on to petition ZBA 22 008, 1300 South Maple Road. John? Actually, Matt, actually. Matt Kowalski, uh, planner for the city of Ann Arbor. Um, this is his uh, site plan project, and he's going to be presenting the um, materials for this case this evening. Yes. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, again, Matt Kowalski, city planner here. So I will be, I think, John Barrett, if you can um, pull up the brief slideshow, um, we'll give you guys a little bit of a background. Oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, we'll get, get through this. Okay, here we go. Okay. Um, so again, what's before you tonight, CDA case 22-008. You, uh, Grace Bible Church, you can see it outlined by the yellow out, out here on the screen. It, the subject property is zoned R4B. It's adjacent to uh, Interstate 94 to the west, as well as um, uh, obviously Maple Road, which it fronts in, uh, close to the intersection of Pauline. We can go to the next slide, which is probably just, yep, just an aerial showing the, the subject lo location. Again, you can see in relation to the surrounding properties. Um, next, please. So, okay, well, we get a little bit closer in here. So, um, again, next, please. So, um, really, this is kind of the how the existing site lays out currently. And um, we'll get to one of the next slides that will eventually show what is proposed and the reason why they're here before you tonight. Again, so we'll get to that. So, if we can see a couple of the subject sites just to um, uh, photos next, we can get uh, re-familiarized with the location. So, if we can go on next, please. Okay. Here's, I'm looking directly at the... Um, at the Grace Bible Church to the left on this picture is the area where the new uh, multi-purpose building will be constructed. Uh, next, please. Uh, so this is to the rear of the of the building of Grace Bible Church. So it's kind of looking towards um, Interstate 94 there. And again, kind of to the left is uh, another existing parking area kind of up the hill as well as uh, the existing church. Uh, next slide, please. And here you look directly at the back of the existing church. Um, and to the right, again, is where a new parking lot is proposed, as well as a new multi-purpose building. Next, please. Uh, okay, looking directly at the area where the new building will be, as well as a new parking lot. Um, next, please. I think that gets us, here we go. Okay, so this gets us to the subject, um, to, to what is proposed and why they, why they are here before you tonight. So um, obviously, I'm sure many of you are, are familiar, at least I know there's one new board member. However, um, this case, as you guys would remember, it was before you back in September of 2021, um, also requesting a variance from the EV parking, which is why they're here. Sorry, I should back up a little bit. They are here tonight requesting a variance from the EV, which is the electrical vehicle parking requirements. Um, this, the, uh, a similar proposal was before you in September of 2021. Um, that was also based on the proposed site plan that you see here. Um, at that time, the petitioner was requesting a variance of uh, 70 spaces to provide 10 on site. Um, that was denied by the Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, since that time, so the petitioner had modified the plan to be code compliant, and um, they, they did ultimately get city council approval for the new development. So the site plan is currently approved. Um, so uh, that brings us to tonight. 
the, um, so one of the first things to, I wanted to point out to the board, which is included in your staff report, is um, the kind of the condition for a rehearing. So obviously this, as I said, this is a rehearing. Um, so I just want to, uh, I'm going to read this aloud again for members of the public as well as the board. Um, so basically the Unified Development Code, which is our chapter 55, including the zoning of course, um, states that an application for rehearing shall be made in the same manner as for an original hearing. The application for rehearing shall be denied by the ZBA if the applicant is unable to present um, evidence to show that there has been a substantial change in facts, circumstances, or scope or nature of relief requested. So um, again, so that's kind of really a first step that the ZBA kind of needs to take is whether or not um, circumstances scope have changed and to um, kind of authorize the, the rehearing here that go through and obviously de decide on the motion of the variance that's put for you tonight. So to that effect is what the petitioner is requesting tonight. As I said previously, they were requesting a variance of 70 parking spaces to provide 10 on site. So what they, they severely reduced the scope of that request. They are now requesting a variance of uh, 43 electrical vehicle parking spaces, which means that they would provide 37 on site. So again, what the code currently requires is that the amount of electrical vehicle parking is based on the total amount of required parking for the site. It's not just based on any new parking area. As part of the proposal, the site plan that was approved, you can see kind of in the darker gray area on the screen here, that parking lot is, is new. The darker area that's shaded with the parking lot. That is a new 107 space parking lot. So, however, what the, um, again, what the code states right now is that the EV parking ratios are dependent upon the total amount of required, not just the new parking that's being provided. Um, so again, what they, but how, this, how the petitioner has based this variance request is kind of basing, using our standards to, uh, based on what is the new parking that they're provided. So they're basically taking a ratio and applying it to the new 107 space parking lot and not the overall required amount of parking that is uh, provided on the site. Um, so what that results in, again, would be whether they're, they're requesting the variance of 43 spaces, they would install 37 on site. How that would be broken out would be in the, uh, let me double check my, it's seven, um, there we go, sorry. It is, uh, the petitioner would propose to have seven EV installed spaces so what that means, again, that obviously EV installed with the charging station, fully installed, so you just pull up your car and you uh, can plug directly in, and uh, 30 EV capable spaces. Those are the ones that uh, do not have the station or the wires uh, to the site. However, they, they're, um, it's properly set up for the future so that when, that, um, when the need arises, hopefully soon enough, then they're able to install it with minimal with minimal disturbance to the existing parking lot or any of the infrastructure on site. So there would be seven that would be installed that would be ready to go and 30 that would be EV capable spaces um, set up for kind of future installation. Uh, and that really concludes my presentation at this time and I am certainly available for any questions. Thank, Thank you. you. So I have a quick question. Um, so I understand that the city is currently working on some parking amendments and um, those were discussed with the Planning Commission at a working session I think two weeks ago um, and included in those parking amendments are um, some modifications to the EV parking requirements which I think clarifies that EV parking is applied only to new spaces, not total spaces. And there's also some elimination generally of one of the EV categories. So my question to you, I guess, since, since I know that's in the works and I know that um, I think it's going to Planning Commission for a public hearing on April 5th, if I'm remembering correctly. Yes. That's um, correct. How, how closely, I guess, does this petition comply with the requirements as stated in those new, those new standards? Like if, if those were approved now, would this mm -hmm. not need a variance or would they still be off from that? I'm curious. Sure, absolutely. Um, so I'll just give a really brief, brief background. Uh, Chair Breyer uh, did a very good job of kind of summarizing this up. 
But um, so basically what the Planning Commission is was has been looking at in the Ordinance Revisions Committee, and as Candace had said, is scheduled for a public hearing at Planning Commission next, uh, well, I guess in two weeks. Um, are, there's lots of revisions to the parking code in general, but the one that's most relevant to this would be that there, the proposals that are before Planning Commission would be to base the number of uh, EV parking spaces based um, just on the new parking that's provided, so not on the total amount of required parking. So what that would, and also, again, as was indicated, they would they are eliminating a category. Right now we have three categories, EV capable, EV ready, and EV installed. Um, the new code would uh, eliminate the EV, uh, the EV uh, ready spaces. So it's just going to say the EV installed and EV capable. So really the two categories of what they're proposing here, and actually eerily, they're, they're very similar. Um, what, what they are proposing, again, to, to remind you, would be uh, 30 EVC spaces and seven EV installed. What the new code would require would be uh, 33 EV spaces and um, six EV installed. So they're actually, they're providing one more installed spaces than would be required. Um, and then there'd be two less spaces that would be for the EV capable. However, I think that, it, and again, it's kind of similar. I wasn't sure if they're uh, in the background of our decision-making process here, these numbers seem to mirror what's actually being proposed. I think given that there's that error, the gap of a couple spaces, what that is, because I'm sure is due to a rounding error, um, both of these, uh, like for instance, the EV capable spaces come up as 32.1. Um, obviously, in most cases, as we've learned, you round down to 32, but we do not do that for parking spaces. We round up. So that's kind of really the, where this difference is coming up, where I say there's 33 required um, is the 32.1, we round it up, even if it's a tenth of a percent. So they are very close to providing one more installed space, um, three, less, three less capable spaces, but again, really only two less than what would be required if we were to base the new standards, or sorry, if the new standards are approved on this parking. So just, there's two less uh, capable spaces that they're proposing. Um, only one more side note I will notice that obviously the parking requirements, as we say, they're going forward to Planning Commission. Um, this is an ordinance change, so Planning Commission is only a recommending body. Well, it seems like there is support from Planning Commission based on our discussions at the uh, ORC, which is the Ordinance Revisions Committee, as well as the General Planning Commission. This does have, the code revision does need to be approved ultimately by City Council. Um, that would probably be scheduled within a couple of months. So um, Planning Commission would issue a recommendation on this and City Council would ultimately approve it. So that's kind of a little bit of a long-winded answer to your question, but hopefully I gave you the information that you're looking for. That was great, Matt, thank you. Thank you. Mike. Right, Matt, so I just want to make sure I have the numbers right. So what we what what failed in September five to four was they wanted they proposed to install three EV installed, three EV ready, four EV capable, total of ten. What they're asking for today is to is to go up to go to seven EV installed. So go from three to seven and then yes. zero EV ready and then go from four EV capable to thirty EV capable. Those are the numbers, right? Yes, that is correct. Okay, great, thanks. Dave. Matt, I have a question. Um, everybody on the board, the zoning board, serves without compensation as volunteers. We all come to these meetings in person wearing masks. Our staff person, John Barrett, comes to these meetings in person. Uh, fully vaccinated, wearing a mask. Everybody on the board had to demonstrate full vaccination, as I believe most, if not all, City Hall employees have had to do. Why is it that when you or Chris Chang or other planning staff have a presentation, that you are not required to come in person to present and to take questions the petitioners, for the most part, come in person, and you get, you're compensated for your time. The board up here is not. We do it for the public, for the good of the public and the community. Why is it that you are able to attend remotely while all of the uncompensated volunteers that give generously of our time have to be here? I can which answer keeps that question, us potentially Dave. from um, having quorum. 
Uh, Dave, that's a, that was a staff decision by the planning manager. Well, I, I'm asking yeah. Matt. Okay. Well, well we're that, on this. Yeah, he said uh, I directed the question at him, but you could answer it later over a beer. But um, <laughs> well, I, I wanted. Right. I just want to put Matt on the spot oh, okay. to answer that question. <laughs> Matt will be getting the beer well, remotely and the public to see. <laughs> That's fine. Fair question. Um, I don't mind answering it. Actually, that, that is a decision that, of course, is outside of my control. Um, but it was an administrative decision. And really, the, the reason behind that is still to minimize the amount of people in an enclosed space at one time. So um, I can't really answer it much more than, than that. Um, but again, that's kind of a decision. Uh, if you do have an issue with it, I definitely encourage you to uh, please speak to the higher ups than me. So <laughs> who, who, who made that decision? I think it was a whole administrative decision. This is like this for many boards and commissions, um, even as well as for city council meetings as well. So I can't say to specifically who would make the decision, but I know that this is for all boards and commissions. It's not just for a zoning board of appeals. It just seems unfair that one of your staff has to be here and the rest don't. I just want to say that. And if it's, okay. if it's the planning director that I need to present this to, I'll do that. If it's the city administrator, I'll do that. Yes, I mean, it, I would go through all of the above because, again, this is for like this for all boards and commissions. It's not just the Zoning Board of Appeals. We typically have one staff member there for planning commission as well, and then supporting staff is able to attend uh, remotely. But, yes, fair question. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Matt? Well, I have one, uh, Matt Todd Grant. Maybe it's a little bit of uh, out of the purview of the ZBA here, but the problem I have with the current EV ordinance is that it treats all parking places the same. And I believe in September, I used the example of a funeral home. Mm -hmm. If it has a large parking lot, people are only there for a short period of time, and the last thing on their mind is charging their car. Here, with a church, people show up one day a week for a short period of time. These parking spaces are very different from parking spaces outside of an apartment building where somebody sleeps all night and the car is there for 15 hours, or in, an, in somebody's home. That's where they're going to charge the cars. And I, and I also have some sensitivity to nonprofit organizations. I don't think the ordinance does a good job of being sensitive to these two factors. A parking place is not equivalent wherever it is. It's a function of the use and the character and how long people are at the space. And I don't see that happening. It's not really, uh, you know, probably part of what I do at the ZBA, but I think it's a big hole. So uh, that said, I'm going to vote in favor of the thing here tonight. There's been a lot of thought and work into it, and that's obviously in, in part due to you, and that's great. But if the Planning Commission is thinking of this, I hope they think a little more deeply about how these spaces are used, given the function of each business. I think that's very important. Thank you. Yes, thank, if, I, if I could just add to that. Um, yeah, no, I, I agree, and you're right, and that was exactly some of the motivation beside, behind uh, the code revisions that, that are being put forth be, be, um, before planning commission in a couple of weeks, as they did go, step, take a step back and look at uses that are a little bit more, um, uh, try to look at them a little bit more specific. And that's why some of the ratios changed uh, significantly. Again, on, on this, they had, uh, it's, it's really previously, the breakdown when we had three categories was 10% uh, EV installed and uh, 10, 10, 15. Um, they've changed since we've eliminated one of the categories. They went to 30% EV capable, which again are the ones that are not directly installed. So they lowered the amount of installs that are required for uh, religious institutions like this. So they absolutely did look at those uh, requirements. But still, again, the EV installed is really where obviously the most disruption, the most cost initially, but still required them to do the EV capable so that again, 10, 15, 20 years, whatever, if this does become more popular, they have these 30 extra. Um, 
spot, uh, spots, for lack of a better word, that they can convert more easily to the EV charging. So they did absolutely look, that's a, that's a good question, or a good comment point, and absolutely Planning Commission uh, did look at that as well. Okay. Thank you. Um, I kind of want to respond to that directly and say, um, you know, this proposal contends that inclusion of the EV parking spaces decreases this nonprofit's ability to address the needs of their constituency. And I, I want to specifically respond to what you just said, Todd, but also respond to the petition and flip the question around. How does supplying EV parking f infrastructure not support the constituency and their ability to support their constituency? The COVID has increased the number of people wanting uh, electric cars for some reason. I can't remember what the connection was, but I was just reading this today. Um, our ability to, to allow the, the, the citizenry to charge their cars um, is important and it's coming down the pike. And so I, I, I wanna ask the question directly, how does the infrastructure to charge your car not support your constituency? And I don't think this proposal necessarily answers that question. And the other thing that I think I wanna say is that as much as I want to offer the petitioner's perspective on soon changing ordinances, we have to deal with what's in front of us. We have to deal with the ordinance as it is right now. And, and I think as a lawyer, you're gonna agree with me on that. We can't play around with, well, in six weeks, we're gonna, we're gonna change that, right? So uh, those are really my two points. And I kind of want to know why, if that's the case, we don't have EVR, which was that middle requirement or middle installation in the ordinance in, in here. What's the 80-20 thing about? Um, so I, I, are we playing the game that, that's going to change soon so it's okay? I don't think that's where we're at as a board. I don't think we can do that. I think we have to deal with the ordinance as, as it's written and as it, it's in place right now. Any other questions for staff, Chris? I can't. Sorry, apologies. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, would you be able to go just go over quickly the um, the considerations for a rehearing that you mentioned at the beginning of your presentation? Um. I'll just, I can kind of just read through that, um, that section again, basically, exactly, which is that, which does say that um, it shall, the application shall be made in the same way as the original hearing. So basically the application submitted, um, discussed with staff, the application for rehearing shall be denied by the ZBA if the applicant is unable to present evidence to show that there has been a substantial change in facts, circumstances, scope, or nature of relief requested. Thank you very much. Elizabeth, did you have a question? Yeah. I, I mean, sort of coming off your question, I so we are, are the initial decision before us is whether or not we're having a rehearing or the rehearing is already happening. So my, I guess I can, my intention was that we would go through our questions with Matt and then before we move forward, we'll decide as a board if we're comfortable with the rehearing okay. or if it's just gonna be denied. Okay. Yeah. Right. I've got a point, question. Okay. I know to approve variances, we need five votes, but to uh, accept a rehearing, is it just a simple majority to accept a rehearing? That I don't Because that's a proced procedural vote that doesn't really need the legal requirement of five votes for the variance. Correct. So, my, so my, my suggestion would be we can accept a rehearing with just a simple majority. Right. So four votes in tonight. Whatever, the, however right. it works out, depending on how many people are absent. I, I believe that's correct, and that's consistent with um, uh, many years ago. We uh, was the last time I had a rehearing, but that was consistent how we've done at that time. Okay, Mike. 
So, I mean, on the rehearing point that Matt, make, Matt makes as far as what, what's the standard, to me, the scope's gone up significantly here. The num total number of spots has gone up by over 250%. The number of EV ready has gone up over 100%. That, to me, warrants a rehearing, um, significant increase in, um, in spaces here. Again, yeah, I'll just agree, I think, for me, that the fact that they're proposing additional EV spaces is a change in scope. So, I mean, it seems pretty straightforward to me, but obviously if anyone mm -hmm. feels differently, <coughs> we can discuss that. All right, any other questions for Matt? <coughs> All right, um, on the topic of the rehearing, I guess, I can take a quick vote. All in favor? I, yes. I move we accept this for rehearing. Thank you, Dave. Support from Todd. Um, okay, we'll do a roll call just to make things easier. Todd. Uh, yes. Mike. Yes. Dave. Devardi. Yes. Chris Fraley. Yes. I vote yes. Elizabeth. Yes. Chris Madigan. Yes. All right. So the request for rehearing is moving forward. Um, we've dealt with staff, so now the petitioner. If the petitioner is ready, uh, please state your name for the record. You have five minutes. Good evening. Um, it's good to see you all in person. Um, thank you for your time this evening. Thank you for rehearing our proposal. My name is Jason Van Ryn. I work for Naderveld. We're civil engineers. Um, our office is at 3037 Miller Road in Ann Arbor. Um, I'm here tonight on behalf of Grace Bible Church. Um, I'm joined by Reagan Sims, who is a pastor at Grace Bible Church, and Michael Hodges, who is also a member there. They are also here to answer any questions that may come up. Um, as Matt brought up and did a great job introducing, uh, we are here uh, tonight for a reduction um, in the number and type of EV parking spaces uh, that are required by the ordinance. Um, I think a lot of you were at the meeting in September and we listened carefully during that meeting um, and there was a lot of discussion about um, basing the number of proposed uh, EV charging stations off of the proposed parking that we were building. Um, several of the board members suggested that that should be the, that would be the minimum standard that would be allowed. Um, so we are back before you tonight um, and we are proposing EV based on the 107 newly proposed state, uh, spaces that we are proposing, as Matt said. Um, these spaces will be constructed, the 107 spaces will be constructed in two separate phases. The EV ordinance calls for 35% of the spaces to be designed uh, for EV charging. And tonight we are asking you to consider uh, allowing uh, 37 total EV parking spaces, seven uh, EV installed and 30 EV capable. So just to get in on that a little bit more, the, the, the seven EV um, cap uh, installed spaces will be built as part of phase one. Uh, in the, and I brought a, a board. I don't know if I'm allowed to show this or not, but Mm -hmm. um, this is kind of a blow up of the, of the proposed parking area. And what we're, what we're doing is we're saying basically we want to build seven EV installed. One, one will be EV, uh, EV installed for the ADA space and the other six will be installed uh, along here in the phase one area. And then the phase two area will have the remaining 30 EV uh, capable spaces. So the remaining EV uh, Charging stations will be made capable, meaning that the, these conduits will be installed as part of the initial phase, but you know, the actual charging stations and the, the wires and everything will not be put in until the, the future phase is constructed. So let me explain why we're asking um, for, for this, this mix of EV installed and EV capable. So first, the church, um, People, people are generally on, go, are at the church for about 75 minutes every Sunday morning. Church has three services every Sunday, and, they, and the services are, it's approximately 60 minutes. This will allow for seven, the seven installed charging stations to be used by three different cars. 
uh, meaning that the seven sta uh, charging stations actually will be um, available for t charging 21 different cars over that Sunday morning. So that's in this area up here. In addition to this, the church currently uh, has less than 10 full-time employee employees that work in the building throughout the week. So we feel that the seven installed spaces will be adequate to service those 10 full-time employees. If the church uh, continues to grow, they will install the remaining um, 30 EV capable spaces. Um, uh, sorry, with with the so so I think the reason the main reason that they don't want to do like more uh, EV installed is because of the constantly evolving requirements of electric vehicles. Um, the church is asking for this consideration to ensure that uh, they do not have to install the infrastructure that may be obsolete by the time they want to use it. This flexibility will also provide the church with the ability to install the right type of equipment uh, that will meet the needs of their future congregation. So likewise, when these additional 30 spaces are installed, um, they, will, they will also each be able to be used three times each Sunday because of the three services. So in all, with, if you combine the seven and the 30, um, each being able to be used three times on a Sunday, that will, that's like 111 different cars that could get charged on a Sunday morning. I think that's um, the basis for it. I think to answer your question, Mr. Farah, the, the reason they don't want to do um, you know, more the, the EV ready or, or why you said that um, you think it's a detriment or why would it be a detriment to provide this to the people that go to this church? The majority of the people that come to this church drive like four miles and they're only going to be at the site for like an hour. So I think the majority of those people will not um, you know, need to charge their car because it will be it will be charged and it'll only have gone four miles, so it'll be mostly charged. So I think um, you know, it just to provide all those additional spaces, just they would not be utilized. And in addition to that, you have to you you know, EV parking spaces can only be used for EV chargers or EV cars. So we would be basically eliminating all of those spaces from the parking field of what you know people would be allowed to park in that didn't have an EV car. So that's kind of the basis for that. Um, but that's um, that's pretty much it. If you have any questions, like I said, we're here to answer your questions. And uh, yeah, we, we look forward to hopefully an approval. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for the petitioner? Nobody. All right. Um, if there is anyone from the public who wishes to speak on this, if you are here in person, please come forward at this time. Seeing no one, if there is anyone remotely who wishes to speak on this petition, please call in now, press star nine. If you're accessing via the web link, please use the raise your hand feature and staff will call on you. There are no callers. Thank you, Kristen. I do not believe that we received any letters regarding this petition. So with that, the public hearing is closed and we're in discussion. Mike. Yeah, so I voted for this last time. I was one of, uh, Four who voted yes, five voted no. Uh, Commissioners Grant and Nelson voted with me on that. Um, so I was with this before. This is a significant increase, in my opinion, a, a good faith attempt to, um, again, go add over 250% increase in total spaces, over 100% increase in installed spaces. Uh, this is continues to be a yes for me, <laughs> certainly. So I'm going to be voting for this. Um, I will say briefly that um, I thought last time what was being proposed was not quite enough, um, but I think this new, this new petition um, with the additional spaces, um, I think is bringing it more in line with some of the other variances that we've granted um, by applying it to just the, the entirety of the proposed spaces and not the entire parking lot. Um, I also, although I recognize um, Chris's comments about changing ordinances and it may or may not happen, for me that does carry some weight, um, knowing that this is kind of the, the path that the city's on, that they're taking action to correct some vagueness in the ordinance. So um, 
the fact that this petition is generally in conformance with what would be required under those new standards and wouldn't need a variance in that case, um, that carries some weight for me. So um, I think I'm generally in support of this. Um, Dave. Um, I support this. I uh, thank the petitioners for uh, coming in with the substantial changes. I believe it's within the, as a, essentially an administrative judge uh, board, the ZBA, it's within our rights to exercise the discretion of considering the uh, changes, proposed changes that are in the pipeline. And this, uh, I, I recognize that the petitioner has worked with the zoning staff and has come in with a proposal which essentially uh, meets the changes that are in the pipeline, and I will support this. Chris? Um, I, I may have mischaracterized the, you know, where I stand on this. Um, I appreciate the uh, interest in getting conduit out there so that in the future, when we have wireless parking, you'll be able to rebuild your parking lot. Um, and I hope you catch the, the <laughs> snide part there. Um, but uh, I think I, I would support this just because of the increase in parking spaces. But I do, uh, the, the logic that it's not a support because it's costing your constituency, um, I, I don't get that. This is a support, this is infrastructure for what's coming down the pipe that is supporting your um, I, I don't know how we get around that, um, but I, I will be supporting it. Elizabeth. I plan to support this. Um, I supported it last time, but I appreciate the good faith effort in increasing what's on offer. I, I will say I am a little suspicious of the math of of these spots cycling through three services because all it takes is one staff person who is manning all three services to be taking up one spot and ideally we want everybody to be eventually incorporating more sustainable um, technology but at any rate um, I will be supporting this and I appreciate that it's um, it's offering more of a benefit more or closer to compliance with the EV ordinance thanks Chris uh -huh. I think I initially agreed with the other Chris, um, just based on the applicant's responses um, and how many times you noted you're a nonprofit, um, it seems like financial reasons are the biggest, uh, well, I guess, sorry, reason for, for not wanting to do more. But I, I think that's very understandable. And I think that um, the cost of more for an addition like this on a nonprofit institution could be so burdensome as to potentially prevent, uh, you know, what is otherwise a permitted use from from going in. Um, so, I do support it. Um, yeah, I'm prepared to make a motion if you'd like. Todd, did you comment? have a I, The motion we have is fine, but I think instead of just saying 37 EV spaces, you should specifically say 37 total electric vehicle spaces of which 30 are compatible and I and uh, seven are fully installed and ready to go. Something along those lines. Hotel, make that change. Good. Thank yes, you. thank you. Were there any other comments anyone has before okay, we make a motion? All right, go for it, Dave. ZBA 22-008. 1300 South Maple Road. Based on the following findings and in accordance with the established standards for approval, the Zoning Board of Appeals hereby grants the following variance from Chapter 55, Unified Development Code, Section 5.19.1, Subsection A, Parking Standards ap Applicability. Applicant is proposing the installation of 37 electric vehicle parking stations, of which seven shall be EV installed and 30 EV capable. A variance 
of 43 electric vehicle parking stations is being requested. The variance granted is in harmony with the general purpose and intent of the requirements of section 5.19. A motion to support. Support from Todd, thank you. Elizabeth. Yes. Chris Madigan. Yes. I also vote yes. Mike. Yes. Dave. Devardi, yes. Chris Fraley. Fraley, yes. Todd. Yes. The request is granted. Moving on, we have no unfinished business. We have dealt with new business. Communications, we have addressed public comment. If there is anyone from the public who wishes to speak to the ZBA on any matter that was not a public hearing item, uh, please call in now, press star nine. If you're accessing via the web link, please use the raise your hand feature. There are no callers. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, with that, do I have a motion to Chris? Yes. I'd like to make Fabulous. Support? From Mike. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? We're adjourned. Thanks, everyone. Mike.